What's your favorite element? What's your least favorite element? Hi, uh, what's the most dangerous element? I think my most, my favorite element is probably sodium, because if you watch the videos, you'll see that Na, N-A, was my, the nickname that my mother used and what my children called their grandmother. And so I think that it still gives me a warm feeling. I'm not sure that I have a least favorite element. Um, because they're just some that I don't think about very often. And I suppose really that the elements <coughs> which don't have a proper name now, like 113 onwards, I'm not very fond of. Though I'm quite fond of element 117 because nobody's ever discovered it, but thousands of people have watched the video about it. And as for the most dangerous, I suppose the most dangerous element would be cesium because it reacts so explosively. Or perhaps fluorine because it will attack nearly all the other elements. But somehow, because my colleague describes potassium as evil, I've always been most yeah. frightened of potassium. Yeah. How did you get the idea to start the periodic table of videos? How did you meet Brady? I met Brady because he was making videos about science in Nottingham. And I'd never thought of making a video for YouTube or making a video about anything. And he came and videoed me and we really got on well together and started talking. And Brady said, I can't remember whether it was then or a few days later, that he'd really like to make a video about the periodic table. He thought it could be done. I was not sure. I just didn't believe that you could say enough about some of these elements. But when then we started making these videos, and I think really it was only after we'd started that we began to understand how we could actually make some of these videos. And I think the most important thing about these videos is that we have lots of different people doing it. And none of us know what the other ones are saying. So I have no idea what Pete or Debbie or Steve is doing, and they don't know what I'm saying. And that's what makes it such fun. So when they appear on YouTube, it's the first time I've seen them, and the first time the others have as well. So I almost enjoy it as much as you. I hope you do. What kind of dog do you have? So I don't have a dog at all. Um, many years ago, my family had a an English dog called the Border Terrier. The border is the border between England and Scotland. Um, which was quite a small dog, but very intelligent. But I have dog toys, but no dog. I have... Um, Hang on, better tell people why you've got dog toys there. Uh, the reason I have dog toys is because my um, son had a pet toad who still lives in the other room. We might be able to see him. And... Um, I have to go to the pet shop each week to buy food for him. And when I, well, I don't even know it's a him, but for it. And when I go, I often buy dog toys. There's a couple here that I bought today. And um, <coughs> these are molecules of C60, or could be something else. Why is liquid oxygen magnetic, but not oxygen? All oxygen is magnetic. The gas, the liquid, and the solid. But... The reason why liquid oxygen is much more magnetic than the gas is that the molecules are much closer together in the liquid. So in the gas, the molecules are a long way away, and the magnetic effect depends on how many molecules you've got in your flask or your test tube. So if you have a liquid, they're all very close together, so you get a much bigger effect when they're far apart in the gas. Why don't you ever talk about the Hindenburg in your hydrogen video? Because it'd be cool to hear your perspective. Oh, look at that. And you've drawn the Hindenburg there, have you? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. I'll, get him. I'll see if we can get him to talk about that one for you. The reason that I don't talk about the Hindenburg, the Hindenburg was an airship that, a German airship that blew up, I think it was in 1936 or 1937, as it was docking near New York. It was actually New Jersey. New Jersey. Hmm. Well, you know, to foreigners, it's all much the same. So in New Jersey, just as it attached up onto the mooring post, 
it burst into flames. And the cause of the, the immediate cause was believed to be a spark because it was earthed and this caused the spark. The argument is whether it was the hydrogen that initially caught fire or the skin of the actual airship. The airship was enormously long and it was made out of very light aluminium frame that was covered with um, some light material, rather like canvas, which was then painted silver. And inside were a whole number of balloons of hydrogen. What is believed to have happened is that actually the initial cause of the fire was the paint on the cloth and the hydrogen only started burning later and then the aluminium or some of the aluminium caught fire, some melted. Aluminium has quite a low melting point. It melts round about um, 500 degrees centigrade. We've even had aluminium melting in our lab. So the reason I didn't talk about it is not sure that hydrogen was the really the cause of the explosion. The Challenger space shuttle, when that blew up in the 1980s, that really was an explosion of hydrogen. Because the, um, one of the rockets, the booster rockets, that um, was on the side of the tank of liquid hydrogen, the tank is the big fat tank in the middle, one of these rockets developed a leak and burnt a hole into the side of the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen tanks and that is what exploded. So it is really, I should have been talking about the Challenger Space Shuttle rather than the Hindenburg. But on the other hand, most people associate the Hindenburg with hydrogen. Well, I think what is sad about the Hindenburg is because the Hindenburg was used as a political symbol by Nazi Germany that America that had helium, which doesn't burn, which could have been used in the um, Hindenburg, refused to supply Germany with helium because it was being used for political purposes. So I think the lesson of the Hindenburg tragedy is that if people learn to collaborate and live together in political harmony, some of these accidents would not take place. When did you start your water bottle collection? Um, may we donate some water bottles for your collection? He'll be very excited about that. There you go. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the water bottles. I don't have any like these in my collection. I started my water bottle collection in, um, I think, 2001. That's eight years ago. I was at a conference in China and I was ill and I was sitting in my um, hotel room thinking about my next lecture that I had to give in the next conference which was about the plastic that's in bottles and I thought it'd be quite nice to have a photograph with three or four bottles from different countries so I brought one back from China and I had found some that I'd not thrown away from other places and so I showed this slide at the next conference and I said, this is my part of my collection of water bottles from around the world. And then I thought after the lecture, well, I better have a bit of a collection in case somebody wants to see them. And so it has just snowballed. And now the shelf has collapsed in my office because there are so many bottles. And these are great. So thank you very much. I shall remember these as coming from your class. All right.